of Public Own Burrows Natural History Society, which Doug came to speak to us about crows, and I left believing that the crow was just about the coolest bird out there. Okay, so it uh, is. It is. It, it is. is. Okay? And, and that's what he's going to convince you of, as well as some other things. Okay, he's an evolutionary biologist, uh, teaches at Mount St. Mary. He's been doing research on crows uh, both here in the Hudson Valley and in the Pacific Northwest. So he will talk to you about the research that he's doing and. If you see a crow with a tag on it, you will call him. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks so much, Susan. Thanks so much, everybody. So I, uh, in talking with Susan about what you what to expect for a presentation for this class, um, I don't know so much as uh, I. I will kind of go through this as a presentation, but I, I see this rather as kind of a dialogue to introduce you to one of my favorite animals, the American crow, and then talk about some of the research that I'm doing on crows where, where they serve as an ecological barometer. So an ecological barometer, have you folks talked about ecological bar barometers to this point? No. no, but when you think of barometer, what do you think of? Barometer, barometric pressure. Yeah, it gives you it gives you some some measure, some indicator of, of measurement. And so uh, over over time, my initial interest was in looking at crows from a, a social perspective, that is understanding their social biology. And what I've learned over time is that they, they do serve as an ecological barometer. They serve as a measure of environmental health. And so we can kind of overlay their, their social tendencies, their social biology um, into the environment and get a sense of what's actually going on in the environment. You know, things that, that you might have discussed already is that, you know, when you look out over the, the Hudson River and the Hudson River Valley, you know, you see a, a, a sometimes pristine environment. Um, but the underlying, underlying trend that we know so far is that the river is very polluted, that we as humans are doing our best to screw things up. And, you know, as, as intelligent as we might seem, you know, we you can track, our, track ourselves through history, look through the Bible, and, and you see we keep screwing things up time and time again. We don't learn. We don't learn from history. So I'm looking at the environment from the perspective of how does it affect the biology of, of uh, my birds. Okay, so, um, so crows, uh, an ecological barometer with social tendencies. So one of the things that I, I'd like to kind of start off with is just a, a view of the United States or, or North America, no, more United States. And this map here shows uh, ecosystem alteration and conversion. Those areas that have been highly impacted by humans, that is the landscape has been transformed from its initial or, or original condition, which if you're an ecologist, we can sit and argue about what the initial or, or original condition is, right? The landscape is always changing through succession. But when you look at this map, um, what's, what's one thing that kind of sticks out to you in the, the distribution of highly converted land? And again, those are kind of those brownish areas. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, you've got this massive layer of brown or, or brown coloration here through the Midwest. And actually, if the, um, if the light, lighting were a little bit different, you could actually see that this is all, for the most part, tan from the eastern seaboard all the way to about Denver, okay? But then what do you notice? How much of it is converted? Not much. Why not? Why do you think not? There's less of a reason to because it's less uh, fertile land. And mm, fertility, you could probably argue. What's something else? Water? Uh, n no, plenty of water. Well, actually, they're going mm. through a pretty bad drought right now. But Population. Population is lower, yes. Uh, I'm sorry? Maybe the landscape is hard to develop. It's hard to develop. Why is it hard to develop? The mountains. <laughs> the mountains, yeah, sure. You know, it, it's, plain as the, it's as plain as the mountains being there, okay? No, this is not a difficult question. 
we haven't converted this land because there are mountains there. And if, you ever, if you've ever done any sort of gardening at all, you know, you can't plant a whole lot when you have a pretty steep, steep slope, okay? So our impact in those areas has been relatively minimal, okay? And so we kind of pick and choose the habitats that we want to manipulate. And uh, with respect to all of the land mass on Earth, 60% of it is covered in agriculture, 60% of it. The other part that we've converted, okay, is all urban habitat. So we go from the Pacific Northwest where you have these open patches in the middle of forest where trees have been clear cut, to native prairie in the Midwest that is completely enclosed now by row crops, okay, corn, soybeans, <coughs> Uh, wheat, and then you go to, you can't really notice it, but it, it, this is Aspen. It looks like Aspen, and it looks like, you, you folks have seen Lord of the Rings, right? Yeah, okay, so it looks kind of like Helm's Deep, you know, as you're coming up the river valley, and there you've got the, you know, the fortitude right against the, the mountains. All right, so we have had a significant impact on the landscape overall. Now, what that has done is essentially put us into greater contact with wildlife, okay? Now, wildlife sometimes is cute and fuzzy, right? You see squirrels running around on campus. Oh, aren't they adorable? But you have uh, raccoons here in, you know, in, in my yard that are uh, feasting on bird feeder food. Um, you have, uh, if you have not seen deer in the area, if you're not from this area and you haven't seen deer, just wait, okay? Because you're gonna see loads of them, all right? Um, here we have a coyote being chased by a dog. Coyotes occur in residential areas now. We have a coyote in our residential neighborhood that we see every once in a while. We have red foxes as well. Of course, and then you have bears that are making a, a comeback, particularly the, uh, the black bear here in the Northeast. So as we, as we have intruded, as we have manipulated landscapes, and as we kind of intrude into these wildland areas and convert the land, these animals have nowhere pretty much to go except to stay in the area and interact with us, okay? And that increased number of interactions with us has led to a, a change in the biology of the animals. It's led to our, uh, our residues, if you want to call them, basically getting into the wildlife populations, okay? And so what I'm going to talk about today is how those human residues make their way into uh, into uh, crows in particular, all right? So, a number of species have literally taken off since, uh, since the planet has become increasingly urbanized or converted by humans. Gull populations. Gull populations, if you've never been close to a landfill area, has anyone dr driven past a landfill? You can probably count thousands of gulls flying over, okay? They have, they have successfully exploited our refuse piles. Okay. Here are what we call the rat of the bird world, uh, the pigeon. Okay. Lots of psychological studies on them, lots of behavioral studies on them, and they number in the millions. Okay. They're one of the, the, uh, the continent, if not the world's most abundant bird species. They too have taken advantage of the amount of manipulation that we've made on the landscape. Okay. And then the final uh, species that I want to, of course, focus on is the American crow. So American crow populations have risen steadily over time. They've had some setbacks as a result of West Nile virus, okay? So they've served as an ecological barometer of the presence of West Nile virus when it first arrived in the United States in 1999, okay? So I'll just mention that uh, now and talk briefly about it later. But these increasing populations now come into greater contact with us. So before, before talking about how they are impacted and what they're impacted by, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about crows and their, their basic biology. Okay? So how many, how many folks have seen a crow? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I know, it's a dumb question, but you know, I was just down in Manhattan College and you know, like same number of students, half the people have seen crows. Where have you been living? <laughs> you know, folks are like 19, 20, 21 years old, where have you been living? living? Anyway, so crows, crows belong not to the blackbird family, okay? not to the, the order of birds that includes blackbirds. Those are the, the red-winged blackbirds, cowbirds, and, uh, and orioles. What's that? Rusty. 
Rusty blackbirds, that's right, rusty blackbirds, which are declining significantly. They belong to the corvids, or the corvidae. And the corvids include the crows, the ravens, jays, like blue jays, scrub jays, magpies, um, chops, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so a number, a fairly broad family, that's one of the older orders, um, or families. And my colleague began studying crows uh, back in 1989 at Cornell University. And when I got there in 2000, um, there was a, a fair amount known about their social biology and their life history. That is, you know, how long do they live? When do they begin mating? But my dissertation research was kind of was going to add to that body of work. So I want to just talk about the basic biology of crows just to get you kind of up to speed on on uh, on these birds. Before we we talk about that, um, do you folks know anything about about crows? Anything specifically, sir? Uh, they're pretty social animals, big groups. They are highly social, so they, they live in, in big groups. Yes, sir? They can use tools. They can use tools. Yes, New Caledonian crow, effective tool user. Yes, sir? Collect shiny things. You know, you're the second person who said that, and I, I don't know what the literature source is that says that they like shiny things, but I can't find it yet. So <laughs> I, I'm going now, I'm, I'm going to make a note of that and, and make sure I look it up. Yes, ma'am? I read a study that they recognize faces. <sighs> Mm -hmm. All right, <laughs> we're going to talk about that. Okay, all right, so, so you folks have a, yes. a pretty good beat on them. One, one of the things that I want to distinguish the, the crows, which are songbirds, okay, birds that, that sing songs, their, their song is not all that melodious, right? <laughs> it's just kind of, ah, ah, right? Uh, lots of variation in the types of cause that they produce, but, you know, that's your general, you know, that's your general shit, okay? So, uh, so, we started studying the crows, or my colleagues started studying the crows at uh, Cornell in 1989, and because these birds are what we call sexually monomorphic, okay, so monomorphic. Mono means what? Single or one, right? And morph refers to the, the outward appearance. So males and females look the same. Okay. Now, they have slight size differences, but unless you've got, unless you know a particular sex of an individual, you can't really compare it to another individual and say, yes, that's a male, yes, that's a female. Males are a little bit bigger than females, but you have small males and big females sometimes. So it's difficult to, to tell the sex right off the bat. So what we did was, or what uh, Kevin McGowan started doing was putting wing tags and these lead bands, these plastic lead bands on the birds, so we could identify individuals. Now, each bird in the study population receives a, a, a nylon tag. These nylon tags weigh next to nothing. They're like tarpaulin material. So, you know the tarps that get pulled over the tops of, uh, of semis? You know, trucks have these big tarps pulled over the top. That's, a, that's the, the um, a consistency of the, of the tag material. Don't weigh anything, or very, don't weigh very much. And the tags are individually numbered, alphanumeric code, number, number, letter, number, letter, letter, number, number. Um, and we go through, kind of rotate through the alphabet and, and uh, number letter combinations. And these serve as individual markers. One of the questions, does anybody have a question about the tags? And, and How are they attached? How are they attached? Great question. Okay, so birds, go and put out your wing. Okay, so, so they have a thumb and they have these two fingers. The other two fingers are gone. They're lost. Lost to evolution. Okay, so these three fingers, okay, you have the forearm here, and then you have a flap of skin because when birds fly, they need, some, they need a, 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 a wing that can cut through the wind. And so they have this connecting piece of skin here called the patagium. And it's really thin, actually. If you, if you just pull up the skin on your, from your elbow, from your antibrachial region, if you've taken a and before, okay, your antibrachial region, all right, you have this little flap of skin. What we do is we, we take tennis racket string and we make a stud out of it. So we push it through the patagium, we put the tag on, and then we melt the top of it. And so now, uh, for any of you folks who have earring studs, okay, in your ears, okay, when you get, it, when you get your earring put in, it doesn't hurt a whole lot. Okay. The birds don't flinch when we do this to them. Okay, so we create this little stud, and now they've got a wing tag. And now we can identify them up to a quarter mile away. Okay, so the tags are about, about this big. And we put them on as the, when the birds are nestling. Sir? How do you catch them? Ha! Excellent question! <laughs> All right, how do we catch them? Well, the way we catch them is we mark the nestlings. Okay, so nestlings can't get away from you. All right. 
Adult birds, adult birds on average take about 30 to 40 hours to catch a single bird. So we minimize the, the trapping rate by just climbing to the nest where the babies are. And the babies, the nestlings, are about 90% adult size when they get to four weeks old. So they start off in an egg this large, and in four weeks time they're this big. Now, we get them, we get them before their hormones kick in and they have a, a stress response. Okay, so how many folks have taken uh, any sort of biology courses up to this point? All right, so do you know what, what, uh, what fuels the stress response in our bodies? Cortisol. Cortisol, all right, glucocorticoid, right? From your adrenal cortex. <laughs> all right, that's all right on it. Okay, so, so rather than cortisol, birds secrete corticosterone, and we just, we call it cort for short, okay? So that's cort for short. So cort, cort levels begin to rise as the nestlings get older, so that by the time they're about four, at the late four weeks old, about 30 days old, they now are scared of us. So when we climb up to the nest, they actually jump out. So we don't like to do that. We get them before that point. But anyway, they're, they're happy-go-lucky folks. We put the wing tags on, we put the uh, lead bands on them, we put radio transmitters on them to uh, allow us to track them into night roosts where they sleep at night. Um, this is related to some of our, our West Nile virus work. But the wing tags, the wing tags have been associated with elevated survival rates compared to those nestlings that don't have wing tags. Now, we don't know why, we don't know the mechanism, okay. but one of the things that we suspect is that predators might be scared of the crows with the big wing tags. But we don't know that, we don't know that. But uh, a, an unpublished uh, study indicates that they do better with the wing tags. So they don't, they're not negatively impacted by the, by the wing tag. Do you have a question? What happens, so you take the nestlings out of the nest, obviously. Yeah. What happens to the mother crow then? I mean, she gets upset. Her, yeah, all of her she yells at us. <laughs> yeah. Then you don't. So you take them and you don't return them. You keep them as they. Oh no! No, we put them back. Okay. We put them back. Okay. So how many how many folks know the uh, the uh, the story of not really the story, but have been told that not to touch baby birds because the moms yeah. won't come back. Yeah. Okay. Com <laughs> You want to turn off the camera? No, it, it's complete <laughs> hogwash, all right? Complete hogwash. It, 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 it's a complete lie, okay? Well, parents tell kids this. This is the way it was kind of, uh, kind of uh, fostered over time. Parents tell their children not to touch the baby birds just because any baby bird that lands on the ground, they're going to start picking up and, and handling. But if you think of it from, uh, from a biological perspective, so does a, a mother human get upset when someone else picks up its baby? You know, you're at the playground and your baby goes crawling off, but would the mother just be like, nope, sorry, you touch it, that's it. <laughs> no, no, they've got, you know, we've got, we have a heck of amount of investment in that offspring at this point, okay? And so do the birds, so do the parents. So they come right back. As soon as we put them, we take them down to the ground, obviously we're on the ground here, um, it takes about half an hour to do measurements and wing tags and all that business. So as soon as we get done with that, we put them back up in the nest and then we say, we'll see you when you get out of the nest. And that's it. Yeah, but that's a, a great question. A great question. So if you ever see a bird on the ground, a baby bird, pick it up and put it in a bush and just walk away. Because the parents, the parents will be nearby. Yeah. 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 Did you notice um, if the tags or bands had any other effects within the population? like? Uh, sexual selection or reproduction? That's a great question. We've never actually tested that, only yeah. because uh, uh, such a small percentage of individuals ever become breeders, and okay. so we, we can't look at the actual selective agents that might be working uh, working toward that end. Okay. Um, I, that was actually one of the chapters of my dissertation, was looking at what factors influence um, who becomes a breeder in the population, mm -hmm. and I couldn't do tags just because there were too few, uh, ultimately. Cool. Yeah. But another great question. You were right. That is a good question. Yeah. Okay, so you guys are living up to uh, what Susan was telling me. Okay, so uh, so we mark these birds, and then we're able to follow, track them over time. So just some kind of neat things about uh, maybe not sh shiny silver things that they like so well, but uh, other <laughs> other uh, kind of stories associated with their intelligence. So uh, if you uh, if you know or if you put out your garbage bag, your trash in, in black plastic bags, uh, they figure out pretty quickly how to rip them open. Okay, not a lot of you know. Okay, so they're not so sophisticated that they can figure this out, right? There are goodies in there. Okay, but what we have uh, we have a couple of stories um, in from our Ithaca population 
uh, this gentleman was trying to capture chipmunks in his, in his garage and, and around his yard and get rid of them because they, they make a mess of things sometimes. And so this guy put out these snap traps and in the snap trap he put a, a peanut butter ball. So you take a good scoop of peanut butter, you take some oats, you coat the outside so it doesn't stick to you when you want to handle it. You put it on a snap trap, the chipmunks come along dee -dee 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 -dee, and whack, the trap catches them. Okay? So this guy was taking the chipmunks and throwing them out into the yard. Sorry, I'm not trying to be completely insensitive, but... <laughs> so, so the guy would throw the chipmunks out into the yard, the crows would come around and, and nom nom nom, right? They'd fly, they'd eat the chipmunk and then they were gone. Well, the crows figured out that they could skip the middleman and rather than worry about capturing chipmunks and waiting for the capturing to take place, they would actually, they figured out that they could take a stick and snap the trap shut and then walk away with the peanut butter ball. Okay. There's not a lot of animals that, that figure out how to do this sort of stuff. Okay. There's also a, a story from, uh, from Kanza Prairie, which is out in, out in uh, Kansas. Uh, researchers doing work on small mammals are using these, uh, these traps called Sherman traps. And they're a rectangular silver box. One, the end gets pulled off so you can put your, your delicious peanut butter ball in the end here. And in the, at the other end, then you put the back on, the other end has a trap door that when the, the rodent enters in, they step on a treadle on the inside and, and the door shuts. And now you've got your small mammal trap live. Well, the crows figured out that there were peanut butter balls inside these set traps. And so rather, tr rather than trying to kind of lodge the door open and shake out the peanut butter balls, they figured out that they could just pull off the back and get the peanut butter ball. Now, the researchers that were doing this work had thousands of traps. And the birds would just go from trap to trap, to trap, <laughs> pulling the back open and, and eating the peanut butter balls. Okay, so they're kind of smart. Right? <laughs> they can figure out problems. All right, so this is these are problems akin to primates and, and how well they can solve problems. Okay? Um, they're fairly long-lived. Okay, so compared with most songbirds like robins or, or sparrows, chickadees, titmice. Okay, all these birds have a survival of about three, four, five years. You're five years. You're doing really well as a songbird. Okay, crows. We have uh, we have a pair of males right now, both hatched out in 1993. Still going strong. Still have a territory. Still have a mate. Okay, females. Females don't have quite the longevity that males do. So we have our relatively old males. Most, excuse me, most males. Uh, on, males live on average about 10 years. Females, on average, live about six or seven years. Okay, so N1 was the mate of AP, AP the male here, and she lived for uh, seven years. And AZ here hatched in 2001, and she's still breeding. Okay, so she still has uh, offspring. I don't know if she's got a nest yet this year, but she'd be one of our, our candidates for a locating. So in addition to being long live, they're also lifelong mates, as far as we can tell. All right, so AP, who I just showed you, and his mate N1 were mates, and they were, um, they were mates until N1 disappeared and was never seen again. And then AP took on another mate. So we've only ever had, we've only ever had one divorce, ever, <laughs> of, our, of all the tag birds in all the study populations. So at, at one time there were, uh, well, there are four, maybe now five, study populations of crows in North America, or uh, used to be. And in only one of those have we ever seen divorce, and it was only once. And so two, two tagged individuals, male and female, got together one year, they produced a couple of kids, and then mom left and found another mate, and, and then the, the parents you know, went their separate ways and that was it. That's the only indication that we've got that there is divorce uh, in crows. Now, that said, that said, okay, so lifelong mates, right? Well, social mates, sure. 17% uh, of offspring come from the non-social partner, okay? So you might be running around with Mrs., okay? But Mrs. ends up mating with someone else occasionally, okay? So 17% of offspring in, in the Ithaca population are as a, a result of this infidelity, okay? An even smaller amount is associated with incestual matings, okay? So a son mates with mom. And it turns out that there's pretty strong selection against 
against those individuals. Okay, you know what selection is, right? Natural selection. Okay, so individuals who don't who don't have traits that are fit for that particular environment, okay, don't tend to survive. They're selected against. Okay, so those offspring actually don't last more than a year. Usually they're all dead within a year. So pretty strong selection. Okay, so so mental note. Don't meet with your mother, okay? So if you don't know that one already, don't know where you folks are from, but we'll just, we'll just go with that as a general rule for, for most animals. Okay. All right, so what, what we've also learned is that the, the crows live in multi-generational families. And it's this multi-generational family that contributes to the, uh, the dynamic uh, identified as cooperative breeding, which I'll tell you about in a second. So uh, family sizes can range from just two individuals, mom and dad, to 15 individuals, which include mom and dad, dad's brother, stepkids, and, and I'm going to anthropomorphize. You folks know what anthropomorph anthropomorphizing is, right? It, attributing human traits to, uh, to non-human animals. Okay, so the kids. So we have mom, dad, dad's brother, stepkids, kids from this year, kids from last year, kids from the year before, kids from the year before. So in this family of 15, we had five years of kids all living in the same family. Okay. So think about your siblings only multiplied by three, Okay, living in the same family. So now for, for the older folks in the, in the, uh, in the audience, um, you can think about you know older your older children still living in your basement um, over time you know and finally you gotta give them the boot right um, and that's what we see within our, our crows here so these individuals that stick behind that that don't leave the parents territory um, are identified as as helpers generally so what they do is they act as uh, birds that come and feed the the nestlings. All right, they feed the current year's offspring. So this would be like you running out to the deli to get, uh, get sandwich meat for your younger sibling because they're hungry. Okay. So the crows do that. They act as sentinels. They watch out over the family when they're foraging on the ground. And they act as social tutors. Okay. So as social tutors, they're teaching the younger individuals what to do once they get out of the nest. You know, what food do they feed? What, what animals do you yell at? What ones do you get upset at, like hawks or owls? Okay. As a naive individual, okay, as a as a youngster, they, these young birds don't know who to get upset at. All they see is, okay, some, there's something going on. Everybody's really excited and calling like crazy. Okay, but why are they doing that? And eventually, they're they're learning this from their older siblings and from their from their parents. So this is a, a scenario identified as cooperative breeding. And if we were talking about, if this were more of a biology-oriented class, I'd, I'd explain what's happening, the dynamics of, of why, why should you stay? Should I stay or should I go now? <laughs> right? So some birds stick around and some take off, literally. They leave. Okay? So that is dispersal. We're either going to call them phylopatric. Phylopatric means they're going to stick around home. Or they're going to disperse. And those individuals that stay at home can either help their parents or kind of loaf, slackers, right? They don't really contribute much in the way of help. Um, but if they, if they do help, they get what's called this indirect fitness, okay? Indirect fitness means that, that part of their genome is being fostered, is being kept alive in their siblings, okay? If you have direct fitness, then you're breeding on your own, and your 50% your of your genes are going on to the next generation. Okay, so ultimately, from a biological perspective, from an evolutionary perspective, this is what we're trying to achieve, fitness, okay? So, from a, a theoretical perspective, if you, haven't, if you haven't produced offspring yet, you're not in the population, okay? So, you're not in the population until you begin breeding. And, and if you don't have kids yet, wait until you finish your degrees. Tell me, just wait, because it becomes a lot more work after. All right, so wait to get your fitness, okay? And the best way to do that is, is through direct fitness. So what are, the, what are the pathways that individuals take to, um, what are the pathways that individuals use to, uh, to begin breeding? Okay, so if they stick around home for a while, and usually males, males stick around for uh, five or six years before they, they go off and breed on their own and females leave at about two or three. Now they're sexually mature at two years old. 
So females leave much sooner than males do, and females and males will, will stick around. So the, one of the best strategies for a female is they leave and they look for a, a vacancy. Okay, so females tend to get killed, breeding females get, tend to get killed more quickly uh, than, or have a higher mortality rate than males do because they sit on a nest for a long period of time. Okay, they sit on a nest for three weeks and until the eggs hatch, and then they sit on the nest for up to another two weeks while the youngsters are, are still too, uh, can't keep their heat body heat, okay? So females wander away from the, their, uh, their own territory and try to find those openings in the, in the uh, neighborhood. Males tend to inherit the territory from their parents, from their dad, or they bud off. Budding is, is taking part of the parent's territory and, and setting up shops, setting up territory that they'll, they'll then defend. Now, some individuals join a group without a vacancy. Now, for males, males, this kind of makes some sense. They join siblings. So, my brother lives down the block, I move in with him, I hang out until he dies, or I kind of scope out the territories nearby. Okay? Females, on the other hand, move into family groups where they're completely unrelated, and they wait for the female, the unrelated female, to die. So, think about you at home and your happy family, and some woman off the street walks into your house and, and says, you know, I'm going to live here for a while. I'm going to live here until your mom dies, and then I'm going to mate with your dad. So it's, it's a bit odd, a little uncomfortable. And, um, and so what happens is these females are harassed for years, Two, three years, they will be harassed in these groups that they move into. But you know what? Eventually, when the, reside, the resident breeding female dies for whatever reason, you know, gets pushed off a cliff, right? It's these unrelated females that become the breeders. So this is an effective strategy to uh, to becoming a breeder. All right. So so just some of the some of the nuances of uh, of, crow, of crow biology. Now to get to your point about. They recognize faces. All right, so here we have a very social animal. They live in big family groups. They live in territories, the same territories for years, so they know all their neighbors around them. And so there's always been the suspicion that, well, they must recognize other individuals in the population. Well, there's a good likelihood that they probably recognize humans, too. We know, by walking through the population in Ithaca, that if you've got a pair of binoculars on and you've helped in, in putting the wing tags on, the leg bands on in the past, they yell at you. They know who you are. Okay? So this researcher at the University of Washington in Seattle, John Marzla, tested the idea that they recognize actual people's human, you know, they recognize human faces. Now, you could argue how human this is, and you could, well, you, I guess you could argue how human that is, too. <laughs> but what happens is, what, what these folks did was, when they were banding, when they were putting the leg bands and wing tags on, they wore this scary man mask, or caveman mask. If you're looking for a Halloween costume, it's called caveman mask. Skew number zero to zero. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, so what they did was, so once they, once they had, once they got these birds banded, they then let the birds go, and then they walked through the territories of the birds that had been banded. And they wore the chain, they wore a caveman mask, and they just went to a Joe biologist. Okay? And then they looked at the number of crows that were yelling at that particular individual. And what they found was that the crows clearly did not like these individuals. You know? And if you had a head that big, you'd be scary too, right? <laughs> but what they found also is that over time, the number of birds that got upset at this individual increased. So birds that had not even been banded or tagged learned that this was not an individual that you want to associate with. And over a two-year time, they went from about 30 birds that would be upset to about 180 birds that were upset at this mask. Okay, so there's social learning that's taking place between individuals within, within the population. They took this a step further, and they looked at the neural basis for this as well. And just for time's sake, I'm just going gonna, gonna to skip past this. But essentially, it boils down to the region of our brain called the amygdala, which is associated with memory and fear, also becomes lit up when these birds are presented with individuals that handled them during the scary interaction of being banded or tagged. 
Okay? They didn't get scared when the caregiver uh, mask was shown to them. Okay? So they have a, a neural basis very similar to our own and have a, a similar reaction to fearful events. Okay, so, so basic background on the, on the crows. And now we, we begin to think about how these animals, which are living in our backyards, living in our neighborhoods, that are interacting with us, getting upset at us, of feeding on our trash, feeding on our uh, feet, going through our gardens, picking through our compost. Okay, can they do? What sort of influence does that have on on their biology? Okay, now we know some species serve as good ecological barometers. Okay, so miners back in the day uh, used to used to carry around or have one of these nearby. Does anybody know what it is? Canary. The canary, yeah, the, can the proverbial canary in the coal mine, right? So, because, the, because natural gases in mine shafts are not detectable, we can't smell it, okay? Much more sensitive to and uh, reactionary to those toxic gases are birds, okay? The respiratory rate is a lot faster. So, if, if your canary kicked it, it's time for you to leave, okay? Because there are probably gases that you shouldn't be inhaling, okay? Other scenarios, have, have folks heard about the multi-limbed multi-limbed amphibians, like frogs here. So as a result of pesticide levels in ponds and fertilizer levels in ponds, the uh, amount of um, vegetation spirals out of control, and those animals that feed on that vegetation vastly increase in number. And the flat uh, fluke worm, or flatworm, uh, makes its way during uh, metamorphosis of the tadpole, makes its way into the, uh, the joints of the frogs and causes this, this multi-limb uh, growth. So you can, have, you can have frogs that have up to eight limbs, okay? So, you know, four is probably good enough. Six might get in the way. Eight is probably too many, all right? Um, and so this, Peter Johnson learned, was that in, in a bio, these frogs and the multi-limb individuals were bio-indicators that, that fertilizers pesticide levels are relatively elevated in the, in the environment. Now, have you folks heard anything about that to this point? Talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we talked about eutrophication because of nitrogen and phosphorus. And this is what we're talking about. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. And what's one of the, do you, do you know one of the bigger effects of this of eutrophication? Well, algae growth overgrowth and decrease in salt oxygen. Exactly. And so what do you end up with? Dead zones, right? The dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico, right? Which are increasing exponentially as time goes on because of the overuse of fertilizers and pesticides. Okay, so so here is one other type of example. So you've got the dead zones in the in the Gulf of Mexico. You've got these uh, indicators uh, of uh, of kind of conditions in the environment going sour. All right. So other environmental contaminants that uh, that wildlife. Uh, inadvertently come across. So these are two, uh, two vulture species, species, the long-billed vulture and the white-backed vulture, both from India. And their populations have declined by over 90% in the last two decades. So now areas that would normally have a relatively large population of vultures have decreased significantly. The reason for that decrease is the use of an anti-inflammatory drug called declofenic. It is used in livestock raising, and it's a way of keeping the wildlife from, uh, excuse me, it's a way of keeping the livestock from getting sick, which means that they can devote all of their energy to growth. So animals can get fatter faster, so you can get them to market faster. Well, it turns out that this particular anti-inflammatory, which is not supposed to be used in the, a veterinarian sense, um, actually kills vultures that feed on the carcasses of those dead livestock. That, um, that the anti-inflammatory was not successful in, in helping. Okay, so huge declines in, um, in these two populations or two species of birds from, from our uh, attempting to raise livestock, raise livestock perhaps in, in a more unnatural way than uh, relatively natural. Definitely not free range if you're following the, the track here. Okay, so other bioindicators. Uh, West Nile virus. So when West Nile virus arrived in New York City in 1999, one of the big indicator species was the American crow. So West Nile virus has a 
mortality rate if it gets into an American crow. Or American crows have a 100% mortality rate if they acquire West Nile virus from mosquitoes, excuse me, or from coming in contact with feces that has West Nile virus in it. So when it showed up in New York City, we had this huge die-off in 1999, and that led biologists to kind of scratch their heads and say, something's really going on here. You don't just see hundreds of crows dying on a regular basis, okay? Literally, literally falling out of trees, okay? So people walking through Central Park, crows dropping out of trees, okay? Which you can imagine could be scary. <laughs> so you don't usually see birds just dropping from trees. All right, so other species not quite as impacted. So here are American crows. Blue jays hit relatively hard as well, um, but mortality or percent positive for dead birds um, in these other orders of birds, including the waterfowl, galliformes, which are the, the pheasants, the turkeys, uh, chickens would be included in there as well, um, and hawks and owls to a much lesser extent. So crows can act as a ecological barometer, but an indicator species to say that some new funk is in the area. Okay. Now, we know that um, past e from past evidence that even changes in, small changes that we might see in the landscape contribute to overall declines in health of, of uh, native wildlife. So this is a study that looked at uh, pr blood protein levels and plasma calcium levels. So these are indicators of quality of food that parent crows are feeding to their nestlings. And what we found is that in rural areas, those nestlings are receiving fairly good food, okay, fairly natural food, insects, earthworms, the like. Um, in town, in these managed or in uh, some, uh, managed areas like golf courses and suburban areas like this quality of food declines. So rather than picking up a, a stack of uh, insects and coming back to the nest with those, parents come back in suburban areas with french fries, with a hot dog, with a bagel, okay, with Cheez-Its, um, any other garbage that they can find. Now, they, they're a food source, obviously, and so the nestlings are satiated, but from a, a, a uh, metabolic perspective, they're not doing quite as well. And so we see these declines in, in levels of protein and calcium in the blood, but then we also see declines in actual weight gain in the nestlings. All right, so, so those, uh, you know, it, it may not be terribly surprising that those, that our suburban areas are probably not quite as healthy for wildlife compared with more rural areas. But even then, as we talked about, eutrophication, pesticides, herb herbicides, uh, are not aiding uh, the cause of wildlife. So one of the things that has uh, been on my radar for a while, and, and it was kind of fostered by, by the fact of having kids, and kids get sick, and kids need um, sometimes treatment, um, is antibiotics. Now antibiotics only came into, uh, came into being within the uh, 1940s and 50s, but as soon as they as soon as they were identified as being a way of killing bacteria, okay, they were quickly, quickly escalated in the number of prescriptions that were administered worldwide. And at this point, as of, let's see, where's my, uh, right, as of 1998, as of 1998, 80 million prescriptions for antibiotics were given. At this point in time, I saw a recent statistic that says, there is one prescription written for every American each year. So we're up over, I think, 250 million in Northern, in, in, what's that? 300 million. We're over 300 million. So 300 million prescriptions for antibiotics are given every single year. Could you survive without them? In most cases, yes. Would you be more uncomfortable if you didn't have one? And what you could survive, you could do well. All right, so they're widely used by humans, rapidly adapted in 1950. Potential issues, lots of these antibiotics, lots of these antibiotics, Many folks take until they feel better, right? Now what happens, what happens if they only take the antibiotics until the point when they're, they feel better? They throw the rest away. They throw the rest, rest away, okay? So the rest, the rest goes into sewage treatment plants, okay? It doesn't biodegrade, yeah? Yeah, but when you excrete, it's still, if you, if you take the rest of them, it's still going into it, that's right, that too, as well. Now, this does, this does two different things. It does two different things. 
Okay, so if you don't take if you don't take your prescription to the very end, right? You're given two weeks of antibiotics, and a doctor says or physician says, take it all, don't stop it. Why? Besides besides the dumping down a drink, why do they say? How do you get resistant bacteria? Um, they don't get off of the like sort of incomplete treatments, and then they can resist it next time. Aha! Uh -huh. You got it. Man. All right. So if we looked at if we looked at the number of uh, bacteria, let's say, in an individual, okay, and their resistance, their their le their ability to not be affected by antibiotics, okay. So here is our resistance factor, and we have it being relatively low down here and high here, okay? If we apply, this is all theoretical, if we say that, that we have a bell curve, of distribu bell curve distribution here, when you take that antibiotic initially, everybody, all the bacteria that you kill is basically over here, okay? You take it for a little bit longer, and now you get kind of the bulk. But for folks that stop the treatment short, I feel better now, why do I have to take my antibiotic? You're selecting, we talked about selection a moment ago, you're selecting for individuals that have a high resistance. Now over time, that even though bacteria have high resistance, if they're inundated with this drug long enough, they can be effective. Not always, but it can be effective. And so what happens is, over time, instead of just the population of bacteria being relatively low, that has high resistance. If we go to the next time interval, and we have resistance down here, and we have the number of bacteria here, now this small number of individuals becomes the main part of the population. And now you have antibiotic resistant bacteria that are making their way through the environment. So not only do you have people selecting for this, but because 30 to 90 percent of these internal uh, of these uh, antibiotics that you're taking get excreted into the environment. The presence of those antibiotics in the environment selects for individuals that are antibiotic resistant. Now, what happens when we we see uh, the, this increase? We have increased use as increased antibiotic resistance across settings. And what this has, well, this has led to increases in sewage and in human trash for antibiotic resistance bacteria. It creates a reservoir of these bacteria. And it's not quite clear exactly how it affects animals, but I'll, I'll talk about a, um, a couple of studies in a moment here. So it creates a reservoir for antibiotic resistant bacteria, and wildlife act as vectors for that. They act as the transport mechanisms across the landscape. So migratory birds, those birds that breed here in the summer and then fly down to South America or to uh, Central America during winter, okay, they're taking those bacteria with them. So not only do humans act as great bio-relocators, okay, but wildlife populations are too, as they are affected by uh, humans. So this can be, they can be lethal to wildlife, all right? They can either cause direct mortality or they can cause indirect mortality by affecting the, the gut flora. And so inside of every one of us, we have millions, if not billions of bacteria. And if we change the composition of those bacteria by eating lots of garbage food, okay? Then we increase the likelihood that we get sick. Well, the same thing happens in wildlife. Now, one of the main sources of, uh, of antibiotics in the environment is the antibiotics that come from uh, those applied to livestock. So, how many folks have been in the Midwest previously? Okay, so some folks have. So, have you seen, have you seen a pig farm before? Have you been, been near a pig farm before? You don't even have to be near it, right? Because you can smell it. You can smell it from a good mile away, okay? So in these buildings, which are about a football field long, you'll probably have about 5,000 pigs. Okay, so think about a football field, and think about 5,000 animals being on that football field. Okay, yeah, I can see it. Okay, would you want to live in whatever patch of land, where are you? Whatever patch of land you happen to occupy at that second, would you want to be stuck there for your entire life, basically? Okay, now what this does, what these environments do is create 
have, and they create environments that contribute to the spread of bacteria and viruses and illness. So to keep animals healthy, you administer antibiotics. Okay? Now, if those animals die, well, you just throw them out in a heap in the backyard, right? And who feeds on them? Wildlife. Wildlife eat these animals. And so when the wildlife consume these animals, these animals are jacked up with, and with antibiotics. Okay? A couple of bird species that are directly impacted. Um, it's well known that animals such as the red-billed chalk, which uh, under better color, this looks like a crow with a red bill. It's kind of, all right, maybe I find that funny. All right, so this is just a really bright red bill, and the legs are actually bright red too. It's uncanny how, how similar they, they are. Anyway, so these red-billed chuffs, they're like starlings. They like to hang around feedlots and that sort of thing, crawling with antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Our Cinereus vulture, um, in a study in Spain, they looked at nestlings, they took blood from nestlings, and they found circulating levels of antibiotics that you could trace back to the local livestock farms. And those nestlings that did not survive, okay, had highly uh, uh, deformed livers, okay, livers that had shut down because of these elevated levels of antibiotics in them, all right? And so, uh, yeah, I, I'm going to put my hand up and say that antibiotics have a negative effect on, on wildlife. Now, the extent to which animals carry antibiotic-resistant bacteria is, is uh, probably a bigger question. We don't know what the spread is across the landscape. Those animals closely associated with, with livestock okay, have an increased likelihood. But how about other animals? And that's where the crows fit in. Now, while they forage, they can find food in agricultural settings, all right? They thrive, they survive very well in human-dominated landscapes like suburban and urban areas. And so the question for me was, do we find antibiotic-resistant bacteria in, in our crows? Okay, so we, we used a series of, so here is a, an adult bird with food in its bill, here is a, a, an adult bird bringing food to the nestlings and fair baby nestlings. Okay. Don't do it. It's got antibiotics. <laughs> okay. All right. So we use uh, so we use a couple of we use a, a main test called a Kirby Bauer disk diffusion assay, which is basically we collect bacteria from these guys, we spread it onto these uh, media plates, and then we put different antibiotics on here, and then we look to see whether there is bacterial growth around the around the discs. Okay. Now initially in Iowa, where I was doing my postdoc work. We made the prediction that we see uh, increased antibiotic resistance to uh, antibiotics used commonly in livestock, and in the suburban set settings, we suggest we thought that we'd find more antibiotic resistance, if any, to those antibiotics commonly used by, by humans. Um, so what do we test? Amoxicillin, streptomycin, bacitracin, okay, vancomycin. Vancomycin, you folks have heard of MRSA, right? Methicillin resistant staph. Okay, when, when it hits the fan, okay, when it comes down to it, vancomycin is what, what gets used, okay? And what I want you to notice is that bacitracin, which is an antibiotic found in um, uh, uh, antibiotic ointment, so if you get a cut, you put an antibiotic ointment, bacitracin, that's what you find in it. Vancomycin. Here, huge number of bacteria tested with antibiotic resistance. Over 50% of the nestlings had antibiotic resistant bacteria or bacteria resistant to bacitracin and vancomycin, much less extent to these other, uh, uh, these other antibiotics. Um, when we looked at the rural and suburban, yes ma'am? Oh, okay, maybe just stretching. That's, it's a tricky one for faculty. We don't know about that. No, that's okay. So, so when we, but we looked, so if we, were, we looked at the, uh, we're interested in looking at the difference between rural and uh, suburban settings. And it doesn't make a difference. In suburban settings, the resistance was to vancomycin and bacitracin, which is not, which is not a great thing, okay? because if these bacteria are pathogenic to humans, which we're still trying to figure out, that says that you, know, you get this, and it's going to be, you're going to be getting more antibiotic treatment to fight these guys off. So I moved from, from Iowa to New York, and started 
a similar study here on the crows in lower Hudson River Valley in, in and around Newburgh. And what we found is a very similar result. So in 2011 and 2012, uh, the red indicates the uh, bacteria that are resistant. So over 95% of the bacteria we tested were resistant to oxycillin and oxytetracycline as well as the, the sulfa drugs, which are kind of the new drugs on the, on the market to fight uh, those, uh, those antibiotics that are resistant to everything else. Okay? And so when you think about, when you get a prescription, just check and see what antibiotic you've been given, because I bet over time you're not given the same thing, even if you have the same cold. Okay? My, my daughter's been fighting an illness for about six months now, and she's on the third different type of antibiotic. Guess what? because the bacteria probably are not susceptible to amoxicillin or to oxytetracycline. Okay. We looked at specifically the E. coli uh, bacteria that were in the, uh, the samples that we collected from our nestlings, and what we found was that uh, nearly 100% of them are resistant to ciprofloxacin ciprofloxacin, which is also another heavy-hitting antibiotic that's administered when you're shaking your head. So you've heard of, mm -hmm. do, you, do you know something about it? Um, is that the one that they, I know that they administer like heavy amounts of antibiotics to some of the livestock, like cows, to prevent them from getting cold? Right. So, yeah. they'll, right, so they'll administer it to livestock, but they also administer it to humans as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. So, um, and again, oxytetracycline and sulfadiazine. So, E. coli, which is in every one of us and which is in most, most animal guts, um, is something that passes between uh, animals. Okay? So if you come in contact with potentially these bacteria, you could end up with something, potentially, now I'm not saying that we know it exactly yet, but potentially this uh, presents an issue to us. So overall, okay, we get to the point where there's lo we have a ton more questions going coming out of uh, the research that we've done so far in, in the Newburgh area than we went when we went in. So how are these things acquired? Where do they come from exactly? Right? The, the crows are not bathing in sewage, so where else are they getting it? You know, can we test soil samples? Can we test trash to learn this? Is it something in the nest? Is it bacteria that are living in the nest? Does it come from there? Is it the helpers? You know, is it these these relatively young individuals that don't know exactly where to forage it to find the best food. Um, are they bringing in contaminated food? This next question we're working on right now, I have a, a colleague in the Czech Republic who's identifying all the bacteria that we've been testing. Um, and of those bacteria, which ones are more likely to have antibiotic resistance? So some of the fun stuff here, you know E. coli, Yersinia. Yersinia is a genus associated with, uh, does anybody know? <coughs> Eusinia? Plague. Plague. Okay. So this is a relative of what caused the plague. All right. This is what black-tailed curry dogs are running around with in the Midwest. Okay. Eusinia, Eusinia. Okay. And Klebsiella and Serratia are, are two other common, uh, common agents that we've tested microbiology. Anyway, so how does bacterial assemblage differ between nests, between nests and years? The, the, the list goes on and on. Okay. So. We have a species that interacts with humans on a regular basis. We, we know that they're susceptible to, susceptible to West Nile virus. We know that they carry antibiotic-resistant bacteria. How, how important is that to us? How worried should we be that, that feces that these animals produce have these bacteria with these particular traits? That's the, the next big question for us. How like, how pathogenic, how likely is it going to cause infection in us? And then are we going to be able to, uh, to fight that infection successfully? Okay. And right now we're working on ravens, fish crows, and American crows here in the lower Hudson uh, River Valley. Well, mid-Hudson, but lower than you folks. Uh, this is Mohawk Preserve, where we're going to work on ravens this year um, and collect bacterial samples from them. And then fish crows and American crows, we just are going to continue that, that collection. So uh, with that, I think, I think I pretty much summarized it. So I'm just going to say thanks. And I guess, I don't know how much time we have for questions. I apologize. Yeah, six for, minutes for questions. Six minutes. OK, ready? Go. Lightning bonus round. All right. So do you have, do folks have questions? Yeah, I have questions. What's the difference between a raven and a crow? Ah, yeah, good one.
<laughs> Alright, so ravens, the, the picture is misleading. Ravens are about two to three times the size of an American crow. Mm -hmm. So they're like red tail hawk size. They're a big bird. They're a really big bird. Yeah. yeah. What are the main predators of crows? Uh, great horned owls. Great horned owls are the biggest threat. Red tail hawks are becoming increasingly becoming a, a bigger threat, and Cooper's hawks are, uh, are a threat. Mostly to females. It's mostly females sitting on nests that they uh, that they're likely to get. Yeah. This would be just a future research question, but are sure. are any of the predators of the crows showing signs of anti um, antibiotic resistant bacteria? I don't know. That's uh, I. I would focus mostly on the birds at this point, mm -hmm. but it's a good question because bird, because crows feed on, you know, on roadkill, right? Yeah. It, it definitely could be. Yeah. 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 If I don't know, so if it, is it yeah. My thought is that it's probably biomagnifying through mm -hmm. the food web. And so by the time the crows are, are picking up roadkill or, or invertebrates, you know, like earthworms or, or something else in your lawn, that they're they're getting a, a good dose of it mm -hmm. that way. But we don't know yet, and that's kind of a, a future project. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Good. So if you tag these uh, groups of uh, crows, basically they're not really moving them? No, they so don't. You're finding them in the same area? They're fairly static, yeah. yeah. And so uh, birds, they are territorial year-round. And for the most part, like uh, about this latitude, they're going to stay put during the winter. When you go further north, if you go up into the Adirondacks or, or you know, into Canada, they're going to be partially migratory. So they'll come down to here and spend the winter here and then just go right back up north. Yeah. But when the unrelated female goes to like another territory, do you like, how, how do you find her? <laughs> uh, we just, we do population censuses. So we drive through the suburban, we drive through our study area looking for where these birds go to. Yeah. And then lots of people, when they see it, when they see a tagged crow, they're like, you know, the hell is that? And they get online and, you know, and, and the internet has been a boon for reporting, reporting birds that have moved in our population. Um, so the, yeah, so this is me, Dr. Uh, so so we have a, we have kind of a, a tradition where if a bird has your initials, you know, if a, a bird with a tag has your initials, you send that picture on to to the, uh, the person. So this is me out in Ithaca someplace. Um, but uh, to the reporting of, of birds that have left the area, so we marked birds in Ithaca in 2000. Well, we've been marking them during the winter for the last 12 years. And we found individuals that we banded in Ithaca, and in Ontario, in um, Quebec. We found them in Maine, in uh, Saranac Lake, in you know, in, in uh, the Adirondacks. And people say that you know they leave during the winter, and then we get reports that they're back. Like my bird's back. Whee! Mm -hmm. Like all right, cool, good to know it works. Yeah, yeah. If you only tag like half of the nest, then so the parents respond differently to the tag ones. We haven't done that study um, only because the, the tagging is really invaluable to identifying individuals. And so the, the unmarked individuals that I was referencing before, you know, the comparison for survival between marked and unmarked individuals, the unmarked individuals were from nests that we couldn't get to for some reason. And so we would keep track of the number of, uh, of nestlings or fledglings, birds that got out of the nest. We would keep track of them over time. But generally, if we've got a bird in hand, we're, we're going to put the markers on them so we can identify them. It'll be the only time in their life that we ever handle them, and so we want to make sure we, we uh, can mark them. Yeah, that's a good question. What happened to the West Nile virus? I mean, we heard about it endlessly, and then suddenly... Yeah, well, the, the CDC uh, still collects data on it, but the state decided that it's here and there's nothing they can do about it, and so whatever. Um, but what we're, what we're seeing in the crows is that West Nile virus kind of went into a lull in 2006 and 2007 as it made its way across the United States. But now it's kind of regressed and it's making its way back across the country and it is, it's pathogenous, pathogenicity, um, basically how quickly it causes mortality has been increased, has increased over time. Um, and no one is certain why, but something about the something about the uh, you know the, the strain has changed, and now it's more lethal. And it's making uh, if, and for folks that have been keeping track at all, uh, Texas and uh, Oklahoma were hit really hard by West Nile virus last year, and 
we apparently in Ithaca there was a significant die off from West Nile virus. So yeah, it, it rears its ugly head and it's got some periodicity, this, this cyclic pattern that we don't quite understand yet. We don't, we just don't have enough time yet. And the movement to human population. I mean, that was the big fear, right? The, I don't, we don't know. We think that mosquitoes carrying the virus came in from uh, Europe or Northern Africa and they were what got the infection up and running. Yeah. But it's still not known. It's still not known. There, I suspect, and my colleague at Binghamton suspects, that, that West Nile virus is probably in kind of in the, uh, the uh, the blossoming phase prior to 1999, and then once it got to some level, that it affected a huge number of crows, and that was the big sign that, that West Nile was here. But I'm, I'm almost certain that you could probably trace it back probably years before. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thanks so much. Thank you.